once again, this is the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. Whatever that means, I don't know sometimes. But we do have people here who are more than qualified to define terms, define life, and help us to move forward. And I'm very thankful for that. And we have Christopher Mowdy. Uh, he has come to us, namely from Philadelphia. And we're so thankful to have you on the show tonight, Christopher. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for hosting me. I mean, let's face the facts. Uh, I'm here at the, the mothership. So anything I can do for you, cook, play, talk, just let me know. You've done some awesome work since you've been here, and I really applaud that. I'd like to talk about that a little bit later in the show. Okay. Uh, we have also Dr. Shook with us tonight. Um, he is uh, the best philosopher that I know. Uh, he's not just great at philosophy, but he's an extraordinary gentleman and loves people. And so welcome, John. Well, thanks. Delighted to be here as well down here in Pensacola. Uh, we have Matthew Steele. He's one of our hosts as well. He's on our program tonight, and I think that uh, he has more than demonstrated his ability to really pull people together into a conversation. So uh, welcome, Matthew. Thank you. It's, it's nice to be here. Uh, I'd like to start the show out like this. Uh, these two gentlemen, you two guys know, I don't. And after looking at what I have, I would like for you, uh, Dr. Shook, to introduce uh, Dr. Hood and also uh, Tommy Coleman. Oh, it would be an honor for me to do that. Um, tonight we have very special distinguished guests. Tonight with us, coming to us from Chattanooga, Tennessee, people that teach and work there. First up, <coughs> Dr. Ralph Hood, who is a professor of psychology there at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. And Dr. Hood is a truly special gifted scholar of international renown and stature, expertise not only in the psychology of religion generally, but also an acknowledged expert on research into aspects of fundamentalist religion here in the United States and also uh, mysticism by whatever name it might be called and also spirituality in, in so much of its diversity. And Dr. Hood has done a tremendous amount of work to help bring to light aspects of that sort of diversity. He's had, uh, no doubt, um, a legion of very productive students, and we're very lucky to have one of them with us tonight, a uh, graduate student, Tommy Coleman. Hi, Tommy. How are you tonight? Hi, John. Uh, uh, I'm actually an undergraduate student, just a... Soon, a soon-to-be graduate student? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, tentatively. <laughs> very good. Well, with a mentor like Dr. Hood, I'm sure you'll do great, and... Uh, let me directly address Dr. Hood. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Uh, I have to say, Dr. Hood, I really like your beard. How long uh, have you had that? A uh, long, long time. We actually can't <laughs> see you guys um, yeah, we currently. Can't. Yeah. Well, it's fortunate that you can't. I mean, uh, it's, it's not always appealing to the eyes. and, <laughs> and So uh, we're, we are going to... Uh, take it from there and, and move forward a bit. Uh, I, I want you to share uh, some of your ideas concerning uh, many of your uh, investigations into religion, uh, Dr. Hood. I understand that you have explored speaking in tongues. Yes, I uh, had a long interest uh, particularly in the Appalachian serpent handling tradition and they're linked to the Pentecostal tradition and they also speak in tongues. So I've been interested in that for a long time. What, what did you find exactly uh, among those who did speak in this quote-unquote tongues? Well, I think the, probably the unique thing about a Pentecostal religion, and certainly in the United States, is in their language it's a religion that's better felt than told. So the emphasis is upon an emotional experience. And way back in the early 1900s, they settled on the uh, initial evidence of baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, as being speaking in tongues. And so one of the things that 
most of the tradition still insists upon is having this very intense emotional uh, experience of the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of that is that you speak in tongues. You know, one of the chapters in the Bible that they uh, work off of, one of the premises that is of speaking in tongues would be found in the second chapter of Acts. Did you hear much teaching concerning that chapter? Sure, but even more so, the, even to make it a little more intense in terms of emotionality, the, the Appalachian tradition that I study, the serpent handling tradition, would not only use the Acts, but they would use Mark 16, 17, 18. And it, there it very specifically says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Right. So people like to be known as sign-following believers. And it says, you know, they shall, in my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. So these individuals not only speak in tongues, but at the same time take up serpents, deadly serpents. And that makes the emotional experience all the more intense. In chapter 2, verse 4, we find in the Greek text there is this particular Greek word. It's only mentioned three times in the text that is in all the New Testament, apophthengasthai. And actually, it, it means to speak with clarity mm -hmm. uh, in, in the sense like an orator would speak, you know, without ambiguity, without slurring, without just jabbering. Did you find that this was uh, something without just a lot of jabbering or... Was it something like that? Well, the, the people I study, of course, rely upon the King James Version. And so they believe there's a plain meaning to the text. And the speaking in tongues for them is a, a relationship between the believer and God. And while some people believe they have the ability to interpret tongue speaking, most people are satisfied with the notion that it's simply a direct relationship between the believer and God. Did you find their, um, their method and their practice to be something that could actually provide translation? For instance, uh, the Apostle Paul writes in, uh, that is to the church of Corinth, and he talks about, you know, it, it's better to have these tongues, quote unquote, understood. Uh, did they follow in that vein, or did they just leave it uh, as uninterpreted or translated? They, they have two, two traditions. One is sometimes it's simply left uninterpreted because it's a direct relationship between the believer and God. And in some cases, individuals will be able to interpret what the tongues is to the congregation. And there where you get a clarity of meaning and a focus upon um, biblical messages. In Acts chapter 2 verse 11, uh, the King James Version, uh, it says that they heard them speaking in their own tongues. Uh, mm -hmm. Are these people aware of what they're saying? In other words, can they understand that these are actually human languages? No, they would. that interpretation would not be accepted by most of the serpent handling traditions. What they would argue is that it's a language that is a unique language between the individual and God, and it's not a language that can be easily translated. So their argument is that uh, chapter 2 would be that these people who heard them speaking in other tongues actually were not, is that correct? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, did you find this to be beneficial for the people? Yeah, I think what it does is it, it solidifies them in their basic faith commitment. And they would argue that the believers, um, because of their beliefs, have this, um, their actions are an outward manifestation of this inward spiritual transformation. So what is follows speaking in tongues is to live and practice a holy life. Now most of these people claim that speaking in tongues is the evidence of having, quote unquote, the Holy Ghost to use the King James language. Yes. Yeah. And could you speak a little bit about that? Well, they, they believe that the, the believer must um, experience the Holy Ghost. And if you don't experience the Holy Ghost, then 
you're lost. And so the important thing is to have this experience and the evidence that all the churches accept, that the primary evidence is that you'll speak in tongues. So if you went to one of these churches and did not speak in tongues, they would try to facilitate and encourage you to be able to speak in tongues. And then when you did, um, that would be evidence of the Holy Ghost baptism for you, and it would be a joy for the larger congregation. Right. Uh, where, did, where do they go with this when it comes to prophetic issues? Are they looking for an end-time relationship? And the reason that I question this uh, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to Corinth, he said, Brothers, stop thinking like children, uh, in to regard to evil be infants, but in your thinking be adults. And then he starts quoting the law. He said, Through men of strange tongues, which is a, a direct reference to what was happening there on the day of, quote-unquote, Pentecost. He said, I will sp he said, Through the men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me. So the question would be, the Apostle Paul seems to think that tongue-talking is, is actually a human language being spoken to that is specifically targeted to Israel. Mm -hmm. And so do these people see this as something that the Jews need? No, I don't think they see it as that at all. What they would do is, is argue the counter case, actually, that while they're aware of, of what Paul has said, they believe that that speaking in tongues is simply evidence of Holy Spirit baptism, and then what follows from that is clarification, teaching, preaching, and living a holy life. So that they would not accept the notion that tongue speaking is, is in the, the sense that you're implying, uh, fairly negative. Right. You know, as Paul continues in this particular passage, he says tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Mm -hmm. And so, do they advocate that their speaking in tongues is actually a sign for those who are of the unbelieving status? In other words, people who are not like their belief? No, they would, they would take both sides. Speaking in tongues is for the believers. It's an evidence of Holy Spirit baptism, Holy Ghost baptism. But they also would say it's an evidence to the unbelievers, and particularly in the group I study, not only is the speaking in tongues evidence to the unbelievers, but even more importantly is the handling of deadly serpents. Now, Paul, he states also in this particular chapter, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around exactly how they're framing these passages. Verse 13 of chapter 14 states, For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. Mm -hmm. Do these people actually pray? for the interpretation of what they're saying? Because I used to be a tongue talker, to be honest with you. So I could go, and um, that would make sense in a Pentecostal church. However, uh, when I let go of that, uh, just to see how things were operating, I would walk in and do something in Hebrew or Greek, and uh, it didn't make sense to them. And so I'm kind of curious. Can you help me? Yeah, I, can, I think I can help you. First place, um, they would recognize that, that somebody could mimic speaking in tongues, but that wouldn't be authentic. That speaking in tongues actually, for the believer, follows from this Holy uh, Spirit baptism. And then secondly, they believe that if somebody is authentically speaking in tongues, um, the, the linkage is between them and God, and there's somebody may be able to interpret that but not necessarily so. So they, they would have a combination of the significance of speaking in tongues to affirm this linkage of Holy Spirit baptism, and then the ability to interpret. But interpreting the tongues then is within uh, the tradition of the gospel and, and interpreting in a way that's congruent with the gospel as they understand it. Okay, I think Christopher has a question for you, Christopher. Sure. Dr. Hood, uh, I really appreciate your, um, uh, your insight into this particular uh, topic, which um, as a student of psychology myself, um, uh, I, I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to tap you um, to take this out of the biblical um, lexicon that Dr. Jones has been talking about and, and kind of position this 
phenomenon, which is also known as glossolalia, um, mm -hmm. in, in a more meta uh, perspective, which, which really has to do with, you know, uh, okay, for, for those of us that are atheists, um, for those of us that are non-believers, for those of us that don't speak in tongues, um, we may or may not have seen um, certain, um, certain demonstrations of this uh, via like maybe documentaries like Jesus Camp, for instance, mm -hmm. um, where, where it seems that it's, it's really something that you're trained to be able to accept and process as compared to something that is genuinely a spiritual um, touching um, of the humans that allows for an openness to the Holy Spirit. Can you mm -hmm. talk to that for a second, please? Sure. I think that, uh, that you make a good point. Glossolalia is a cross-cultural phenomenon. It can occur in religious and non-religious contexts. And there's little doubt that individuals exposed to um, glossolalia can learn to uh, speak it themselves. And in fact, what, what I usually argue is that people actually enter into this um, mild trance state in which by letting go of inhibitions, they're able to speak in what appears to be a language, but clearly isn't a language, and then they imbue it with religious significance. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the idea of trance state because, uh, uh, as I've heard it talked about before, it's uh, somewhat hypnagogic and, uh, you know, the trance state that you're talking about uh, allows for, um, once you dip into it, um, you can embrace it, um, if you're familiar with it, in such a way that it, that it is a genuine, uh, let's talk about humans as an organism, it's a, it's, a, it's a genuine catharsis, right? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't need to make sense. Um, it, is, it is a release, in, in a sense. Um, and that release, when done in concert with other people, facilitates a feeling of community. So I, I'd like you to talk about that for a second. Well, I think you're right. The first thing is, of course, you can uh, enter in this state, and then as, in using your language, you can embrace it, and when you do embrace it, it is this intense emotional experience. And when you're doing it in consort with under, in the other individuals, you're all sharing in this intense emotional experience. And then when it's framed within religious language, it takes an added significance of uh, being evidence for these people of possession by the Holy Spirit. But of course, you don't have to religiously frame it that way. But it is, in the Pentecostal tradition, heavily encouraged and consistently framed so that individuals learn to enter into and exit from this trance state almost at will. So if, if, if I can just bring up one, one more thing um, um, before, before I get interrupted. What is the difference between the trance state that is facilitated by glossolalia and meditation? Well, meditation, of course, is, is a state that would be hypoarousal, that is, you're not intensely aroused, and glossolalia would be at the other extreme. But both states can uh, share a similar uh, sense of loss of self, merge it with something larger than yourself. But one does it by, if you will, withdrawing from the, the, the uh, emotional intensity, and the right. other does it by uh, facilitating and entering into this emotional intensity. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Hood. Um, there, there are um, meditative states that um, are based on um, physical movement and arousal, um, like, um, you know, and, and I have to admit my naivety with this. I, I've only heard about this on the fringes of conversations that I've had with people. But aren't there people that engage in um, dance and movement um, oriented meditation where the arousal level could meet very well the glossolalia arousal level? Sure, and the, the, you're exactly right. And for instance, I did some studies in Turkey dealing with um, the Sufi tradition and with the, the people who engage in, in a dance that is an arousal state, but there's also meditation, for instance, that simply focuses upon perhaps a sacred word that's extremely withdrawn and quiet. 
So the meditation covers a wide range of activities, some of which increase arousal and some of which reduce arousal. Okay. Great. Great. Hello, Dr. Hood. Um, I thought of a question along this same train of thought. Um, some folks are aware, as you're very well aware, that acquaintance across the world's religions with intense emotional experiences, experiences that seem extraordinary, perhaps because the physical world seems to be less relevant or fade away, perhaps even one's sense of self is profoundly offer, uh, altered. Are you more with the side of those who think that there may be empirically some sort of common, oh, I don't know, core, I don't dare say essence, <laughs> uh, across many, if not most, of these sorts of experiences? Or would you sort of stay away from that and have a different way of trying to account for these very real human experiences that sometimes get thrown under the same name? but may not necessarily have any common essence to them. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I understand the difficulty using the word essence, but actually I do um, fairly strongly side with the common core theorists. That I, I do it in a way um, that, that pulls off of William James. And so what I would like to state is that when William James wrote the varieties of religious experience. If he were writing that book today, um, it would be the varieties of spiritual experience. And it is subtitled, A Study in Human Nature. That's right. And James argued that <coughs> what he thought the root and center, center of all religion was mysticism. And my argument is that there is a common core to the mystical experience that is variously interpreted in different cultures, in different traditions. And so while the interpretation can vary widely, I do think that psychologically and empirically, we can detect a common core that they all share. Mm -hmm. um, exploring the phenomenology of religious experiences is one thing. Trying to get a handle on how they are aroused, how much intentional, um, uh, affect a, a person has in, in uh, creating, uh, manipulating them, controlling them, understanding. That's quite another. Um, some, someone might say, well, you need a religion, you need a community to really sort of inculcate you, give you some technique in order to reliably arouse this, uh, the, this uh, you know, sort of poor religious experience, or is it, is it the other way around? Um, perhaps, as, as William James seemed to lead, people just have these extraordinary experiences sort of all on their own without really having to have in mind any particular theological framework, although the framework may come in handy later on for interpreting it. Which is it? Is, 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 you know, it's sort of like that nature-nurture debate. Here, obviously, these are deeply entangled features. But do you uh, side with James more or the other way? Well, I would give a slightly different reading of James. It's not either or. James would accept, number one, that you could have spontaneously occurring experiences that aren't triggered or facilitated by any kind of intentional action on your part. In fact, one of the criteria he used for mystical experiences was specificity for that very reason. But it's also the case that, and James would admit this too, in many religious traditions there have been techniques that have been um, encouraged to foster these kind of experiences. So you can think of the great Catholic tradition in which there's a whole series of practices in order to facilitate um, mystical experiences. So my argument is that the experiences can be facilitated by practices that can occur both within and outside of religious traditions or also they can occur spontaneously uh, by means of which the person is is not actively involved in trying to produce them. Oh, that makes sense. And, and one last follow-up question before I sort of hand the ball back off to Dr. Jones. Uh, do religions 
in their sort of more theological role, help to filter religious experiences. That is to say, you know, as, as we've already been talking, you've been able to point us in the direction of understanding that although there can be a, a common core, there can also be great variety in terms of affective degrees, uh, the degree to the extent that there's an intellectual component, perhaps none at all, or perhaps it's really, in a sense, speaking to a person. Um, do, do religions serve a filtering function, trying to tell the individual that these aspects are legitimate, those other aspects you don't really want or ignore, don't pay attention to those aspects? Sure, and I think the, the whole discussion going on in contemporary psychology of religion between whether somebody is religious or spiritual hits on that very issue. Yes. That there's a whole group of people who will self-identify themselves as being spiritual but not religious. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they choose that identification is they think that religions tend to constrain and constrict not only beliefs and behaviors, but also what are acceptable experiences. Well, uh, Dr. Hood, uh, based on what you just said, I, I know that you're talking from a Jamesian uh, perspective, and, uh, and I knew that one, uh, one, of, one of his concerns was new religion in the United States. Uh, I kind of want to jump um, f um, psychologists to uh, Jung, right? Because mm -hmm. um, uh, Carl Jung very much, um, in, in his uh, uh, identification of archetypes and... Um, and religion and uh, uh, the way that he psychologized things. Uh, I, I kind of want to get into the fact that spirituality and uh, uh, trance states, um, mysticalism, um, everything that you're talking about, all these buzzwords um, can be couched in psychological terms that have nothing to do with religion, right? Because, um, and the reason why I bring up Jung is because some people have taken him as a pivot point to apply a more scientific method to, um, to, the, to the experience of spirituality. And, um, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that because, I mean, we, we're talking in, I'm trying to take it a little more meta, to be honest. Um, we're talking specifics, spirituality, mysticism, uh, catharsis, uh, trance state, uh, glossolalia, those are all very specific things. Um, and they can be talked about in a religious context, but um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to take it into a more psychological context. Um, how, how are these things related to the human experience? Um, how are these things allowing people to fulfill the quality of life that they're looking for and, um, and what does that have to do with psychology? Okay, well, if, if we take a union perspective for a second, um, the, the, the argument that I would probably put forward is that we're reminded that Jung carved over to the entrance to his house the phrase that whether called or not, the gods are here. And Jung would argue that the reason we have religious language is because it's the avenue by which we express particularly profound human experiences. And these human experiences are universal. So if you look at the notion of the union archetypes, the archetypes are there and they express themselves in human behavior. And as they express themselves, they need some kind of framing. And therefore, Jung would be sympathetic to a religious framing because it verifies and legitimates the actual human experience. And that actually is the position that I think you can interpret James to be saying as well. Religion, James was careful to avoid any discussion of religion. In fact, the, the argument that, the, that has led to all kinds of debates is William James would make a distinction between experience and its interpretation. And he would try to bracket out as much as possible the interpretation and focus on the experience. And if yes. we switch it over to Jung now, then Jung is focusing on what are um, the very basic aspects of human experience well, derived from archetypes. 
and eventually finding expression in religious discourse, that the discourse should never cloud the psychology of the actual lived experience. Well, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to draw a distinction um, between the Jungian and uh, uh, Jamesian um, uh, schools of thought, if you will. It, it almost sounds like the way that you're explaining it, and I'm, and, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase, and I, uh, I'd love for you to clarify um, where I'm going wrong with this, if I am. Uh, it seems like you're saying the Jamesian experience is very much um, based on uh, individual subjectivism, whereas the way that you described Jungian was that um, archetypes exist, and they happen to manifest through humans, as compared to the archetypes being a manifestation of what humans do. Yeah, I think, I think that distinction is a legitimate one. I think James is, is, you can overdo the subjectivity in James, because keep in mind his argument about mysticism is that in the end it was noetic, and that's one of the primary criteria. And this notion of loss of self and a sense of merger with a larger self for James is not merely a subjective thing, but is also objective and led James to say, in the end, that's why he's willing to use, in his own language, a term like God for that kind of experience. And I think that the notion of Jung is that the archetypes, if you will, um, manifest themselves in human behavior, but in some sense um, are not dependent upon that. That the archetype is almost, you would have to read it, in a platonic kind of sense, that it's it's like an eternal form that manifests itself in the particular experience of the individual. Yes, excellent. Uh, that that was a wonderful explanation. That, that was powerful. Um, if, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to, I, uh, I would like to open this up. Uh, I think Matthew Steele had a had a comment a, a little while ago, but I think that he was uh, stifled in his ability to uh, explain it. So Matthew, uh, what do you have to say about this? No, honestly, um, I have just been listening with incredible fascination. Um, this is this is a topic that I find very, very interesting. Um, I I grew up in the in the deep south, and it's um, it's been something that I I haven't experienced firsthand. Uh, I've I've been in the Pentecostal environment, but as far as snake handling and that sort of thing, it, it's not something that I've ever seen. Um, so I've, I've always sort of been fascinated by it. And speaking in tongues is, I think, an, a very interesting um, cultural phenomenon. I think that, that you were covering very well how that relates to um, uh, what could be considered a, a sort of secular religious uh, or spiritual experience with um, uh, music, with dance, with, with ways that people can sort of uh, ritualistically um, relate to uh, an experience that they're sort of priming themselves for. Whether or not they are consciously aware of it, the, the priming is what seems to be the, the trigger, almost like a, um, uh, or the ritual itself is to enter that state. And it's not, um, uh, it's not like uh, the way that I see it, the way that I've always experienced it, it's, it's something that can happen on its own without you intentionally doing it but you can also do it yourself if you choose to and in that way I think it's a very powerful experience that that uh, that people can have um, whether or not they they try it's it's uh, uh, almost like a, I, I'm not I'm not sure how to describe it because this isn't something that I have um, frequently experienced myself um, I I don't pretend to understand the sort of religious fervor that someone goes through um, in, in a, a trance state or a, a deep meditation or something like that. I, I've never been that deep into it. I, I have done meditation, but this is all fascinating to me. And I've been doing a little bit of research as well myself lately on noetics and the, the whole subject I, I, I just find fascinating because it almost seems to be a, uh, a, a separation, if you will, of the, uh, the direct sort of um, uh, almost cookie cutter explanation for a religious experience for for how you you, you feel spirituality 
uh, and how that changes as our understanding of quantum dynamics uh, is enhanced as as we start to uh, imagine what 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 it's really like to uh, explain these these phenomena in a in a way that um, um, it doesn't necessarily have to do with, say, a literal interpretation of any any holy text. It's it's really um, more a matter of of how the brain works and how you understand what's going on. What and the the notation that you end up assigning to that, the the the, the how you interpret it is, I think, the perhaps the most fundamental um, uh, issue in religion in in human history how you end up deciding what that means and and w how you explain it to other people and with confirmation bias involved as well um, just in the human experience and not not in a, any sort of a derogatory way but just but just by relating the idea to other people you end up in a way informing how they can and will um, uh, experience it themselves in the future that's that's kind of the beauty of um, uh, human interaction and human relating to each other at all, but sharing of ideas and experiences, it's, it's a really beautiful and uh, can be a very passionate thing in and of itself. So when you add these very intense and um, uh, help, uh, completely healthy, as far as I can tell, um, uh, I, I don't even know to, how to put the word on it, 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 it doesn't even count as an, as an experience. From what I can tell, it, it's more of a of a, an altering of your 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 identity, altering of your your state of being. Um, I, I hear a lot of people who are, are very um, avid uh, uh, meditators. I guess you could say. Um, I hear them explain it as if they're sort of losing their their personality. They're no longer themselves. They're sort of a, 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 an interpretation of. Um, they're in, they're just sort of a, a pretending to be a human being um, in, in a way. They're they're just sort of a cell in a large organism. But Matthew, Matthew, all of it, it Matthew, it's if I can it interrupt seems for to one me second. that that is where religion is going. Matthew, if I can interrupt for one second, um, as somebody who engages in meditation, it's not so much um, it's not so much the way that you described it, in as much as it's uh, uh, or giving up your body. Uh, or whatever, but but it, it it has more to do with the recognition that the um, that your body is a housing for these experiences through which you know you are a um, uh, a conduit, and and I don't mean to be nitpicky, but I I think based on the kind of conversation we're having, uh, that level of nuance is kind of necessary because of, of course, and and uh, again, I'm I'm talking about something that I haven't experienced directly, so I'm I'm guessing from what I'm hearing, other people tell me, so that that that's fine. I, I absolutely it I I want to have the best understanding of it that I can because that seems to be not only where religion has come from in a lot of senses that sensation that that. Um, that um, sense of, of uh, state of mind, but it seems to be where it's going now as well as we learn more. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'd like to direct a question to uh, uh, Tommy Coleman because, he, I mean, Tommy, I mean, you've done research on the nuns, uh, people who don't consider themselves um, theistic uh, or maybe even spiritual uh, to any degree. And, and the bottom line is, Tommy, there are people that don't believe in God, that <coughs> consider themselves uh, spiritual, um, that are happy, myself included. Um, I am a, an atheist such that uh, I don't believe that there is anything supernatural. And, and, that's, and you know, if you were to corner me, I would argue it, but I'd prefer not to argue it. I would rather that just be a statement of how I feel. And that being said, I want to have awesome dialogues with people that may or may not agree with me. That being said, um, there is a whole cohort of people like myself that don't believe in spirituality, that engage in meditation, um, that satisfies a certain human psychological need um, that facilitates recognizing how human 
I am. So Tommy, I, I would like you to talk about uh, the research that you've done having to do with people who identify themselves um, as able to not be theistic and maybe not be atheistic, but somewhere in the middle that allow for this recognition <coughs> that things like meditation are really facilitating an ability for me to get in touch with the emotions and the processes and the experiences that allow me to be human. Uh -huh. I'd like to start out uh, by perhaps going back to William James, and it's, I think it's often overlooked in the varieties that he notes, uh, he chooses to call this collection of experiences uh, religion, and it's but a personal choice for him. Um, that, 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 is, that is his label that, that he chooses to use, and he also gives examples in the varieties of religious experience that are not framed religiously and religious language is not used. So uh, oftentimes in research uh, and just life in general, people who aren't religious, who, who aren't uh, believers in the supernatural, often get kind of shoved aside for having these uh, incredible experiences. Um, and so certainly religious language is not necessary for the framing of um, incredible, profound experiences. Yes. And, and certainly one can have those uh, without being religious. And, and I think it's, also, it's problematic um, to label any type of profound, exceptional experience as religious, less, uh, there's some kind of will to religion, and that we are all religious if we have all um, and experience, you know, great profundity, uh, I think I butchered that word, that in our life. That, that was a great word. How, how many syllables was in that? <laughs> <laughs> profundity. No, in, in keeping with James's pragmatism, um, he would certainly, uh, he, he probably agrees that we all know what I was trying to say. Uh, oh, I'm busting well, your chops. Let me, let me bust in here. Uh, Dr. Hood, you, you've, you've heard people try to put words to experiences. But in the end, don't really words get in the way. Um, it's said that what's best about these extraordinary experiences is that words uh, fail. And for a philosopher, I'm interested in a conundrum. And if you can help us understand some way out of this conundrum, I would be, awesome. I would be delighted. Here, here's essentially the problem when you're trying to research something like mysticism. I'm not going to tell you you, haven't, you don't know intimately well, but sort of just to keep our audience up to speed. If you talk to a person who's had such a, a, a mystical experience, regardless of whether they call it mystical, suppose you're dealing with someone who very clearly has come away from that experience claiming to have been in direct contact with something utterly unnatural. Uh, whether they regard it as supernatural, I don't know, but they, 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 it's extra natural, paranormal, something. It's clearly, they believe, not of this world, and if you ask them why, they can tell you, well, I was immersed in it. It wasn't like a sign or a signal, something natural that you have to interpret that may have come from beyond. I, in some sense, was it. I was unnatural. I was there. You weren't. You can dispute my terms all you want. You can tell me I'm interpreting it. You can make a philosophical or psychological distinction between the essence of the phenomenon and the interpretive framework. But this sort of mystic will tell you, no, you, that's your framework you're imposing on me. If you really understood my essence, you would discard the framework and just simply describe it as direct contact with the unnatural, and that's how I know the unnatural exists. In other words, the mystic is the one fighting the researcher because for the person who underwent the experience, there is no, by definition, distinction between the framework and the core phenomenon. They fused. The experience simply was unnatural. It wasn't of or about or for or with or next to or, you know, maybe next week. It was the unnatural, and hence they don't accept naturalism. It, how do you, do you just sidestep this problem in the psychology of mysticism? Do you just say, well, they, they're kind of just forced to, to, to take that position. There's nothing we can really do about it. We're not about to agree that the unnatural exists so easily. But uh, isn't there a bit of a dance that one has to do with these sorts of mystics? 
Yeah, I think there is a dance, but on the other hand, I always, even as a psychologist, take ontological issues um, very seriously. So I think that one of the things that everybody agrees about mysticism is it's at least claimed by the person who experiences to be it to be ineffable, that it can't be expressed in words. And therefore that little dance begins because any words you use to express or frame it uh, necessarily falsify it. So the psychological task is to try to see if you can facilitate or elicit that experience in individuals who then can recognize among themselves that in some sense um, they know what they're talking about when what they're talking about is not really it. So the language is to evoke in some sense the experience, but in no sense is it taken to be descriptive of that experience. Oh, well that, that's, that's actually very helpful. Um, I, I'm inclined to, to take that way out of the maze, but let me put a sharper point on it. Uh, okay. I happen to presently be a, a, a skeptical unbeliever, an atheist if you will. If mm -hmm. I had an experience that had uh, uh, the essence, the core, would I in all probability become religious or, I, or could I have that experience and remain an atheist? Yeah, I think, I think you could remain an atheist because again, I think the question would be, what is the nature of the experience, not how you frame it? So for instance, in all of my research, I've worked hard with a, a scale I've constructed that uses no religious language whatsoever and allows people, if they want to, to give the experience a religious interpretation. But it turns out that the people that are most alike are really intense, devout people who have these experiences and people who are non-religious, who are atheists, who also have similar experiences. I, jumping in here for a second, I think it's very helpful to take the personal ontological worldview uh, of the individual serious. When uh, someone says they have a profound experience and they're a believer and they want to label that as, as religious, uh, they can. If someone has a similar, uh, equal experience who says they don't believe or not religious, um, their, their commitment to a non-religious worldview, uh, we shouldn't violate that. They can have uh, an equal experience, however, they're not going to become religious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so there's a sort of, uh, uh, from a scientific standpoint, a, a sort of methodological, I don't know what to call it, certainly not atheism, something like a sort of methodological <laughs> agnosticism, perhaps, or just hands-offism. <laughs> Agnosticism. Yeah, agnosticism. Yeah. No, agnosticism. Ignosticism. Where you, you, you even think that agnosticism presumes too much. Uh, uh, whatever, Gnosticism. No, we want the opposite <laughs> of Gnosticism. We want anti-Gnosticism, I guess. Um, I but, notion, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Well, I was about to finish my thought, and I just was looking for a segue to give you an opportunity to tell us more about what you and some of your students are discovering about spirituality for the, uh, quote, unchurched, as you will, as some put it, people who have abandoned the religious framework. Do, is that where most of this spiritual but not religious framing is coming from? They, they want to hold on to the emotionality, the aesthetic, the, the profundity of the experiences, uh, despite having walked away from their churches. Yeah, I think it, especially in, in the, certainly in the Western world, the spiritual um, but not religious is actually almost spiritual anti-religious. And the reason is they believe that religion is too reified in its interpretation and in its, its uh, framing so that people who are spiritual but not religious are uh, amazingly and wonderfully eclectic in their practices. But what they insist upon is that neither science nor religion is the authority on the way you frame the experience. So they're more experientially oriented and less interested in the framing and specific interpretation of that experience. Oh, that's, well, that's, that's uh, very helpful. Um, a follow-up question though, real quick. 
because they're eager to leave frameworks behind, this collection of spiritual but not religious, would that mean that they would have less in common with each other because they've left comparative frameworks behind and so they're sort of scattered all over the map uh, according to what sorts of subjective experiences uh, yeah, well, they've they're, had? They're wonderfully uh, eclectic, as I've already said, and they're, they're very fluid in what they accept. So actually they, what they share in common is to focus upon experience but what they don't share is any fixed um, necessity of interpreting it a particular way. So you can go into some of these these people's homes and they'll have a statue of Buddha and rosary beads and an incense candle and all mixed together. And if you ask them to try to put that in some kind of systematic logical framing, they simply don't want to. They don't have to. Very good, very good. Who would like to go next? I have many questions to ask Dr. Hood, uh, but you know, one of the things that I'm really impressed with is that you are able to study uh, not just the people, but their doctrine. It sounds like you're really apprised of you know, what these people are, are looking into. And so I guess one of my questions to go back to the Bible, that is the King James Version, uh, in this particular version, it says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, uh, that's italicized. Uh, do these people actually believe that they're speaking in an unknown tongue when even the King James Version uh, indicates that the term unknown is not really there? Actually, uh, there's a, a curious history of the early Pentecostals who actually believed that they were uh, instantly gifted with uh, an unknown tongue, a different language. And some of the early Pentecostals, for instance, were thought to be speaking Chinese. And they would go to China to, to speak. And when they spoke in tongues in China, of course, nobody understood them. So it quickly became falsified that nobody is given an unknown language that is a foreign language instantaneously. So again, the, the people that I study have moved towards believing that that language is a language between the individual and God. And that language is not to be translated in as a regular language. But again, there are some who believe they can interpret it, but probably the predominant perspective is when you're speaking in tongues, it's a conversation, a dialogue between you and God directly. Uh, in your studies, uh, and I, I've done uh, several years of research in, uh, as a linguist, uh, trying to identify uh, these languages, uh, or these sounds, I should say, as languages uh, that we speak, uh, a known language of any kind. And I have not found any uh, evidence that they are. Have you? No, and the consensus of scholarship among linguists is that the, the tongue speaking, while well, it follows a particular pattern derived from the language that you are speaking, the, does not form a language. And no scholar, uh, virtually no scholar, believes that glossolalia is actually a language. You know, when, when I questioned many of the people who did speak in tongues and claimed that they could also interpret, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would always ask questions. It seems like, you know, you're saying the same thing. In fact, you know, after recording time and time again, the same people saying the same thing over and over again in the same uh, quote-unquote tongue, uh, they would give various interpretations. What kind of explanations did you get to the same thing said, but different interpretations of the same thing well, said? Well, of course, from a psychological perspective, um, since the tongue speaking is not a language, the interpretation becomes valid only to the extent to which the congregation accepts it. So that usually somebody will interpret what the tongues is saying, and as long as it's interpreted in a way that the congregation accepts, then the validity comes from that social acceptance. And if somebody tried to interpret tongues, for instance, to be counter to some doctrine of the church, then they would be silenced, and it would not be accepted as a legitimate interpretation. 
just one other question before I give it back to uh, Christopher. Uh, did these people actually place this in the context of being subject to the prophets? Because this is also found in chapter 14. I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, when speaking in tongues or doing anything in a spiritual sense in a context like this, it was stated, that is, in the King James Version, if we are to take that as a, an efficient meta-language. Uh -huh. uh, since this is the version that they are using, they, they would suggest that if you do have, uh, for instance, find that kind of protocol in this particular system that you studied? Uh, Dr. Jones, I think you cut out for about 10 seconds. Uh, I, I, I do apologize. Uh, what I'm trying to ask is, uh, in if we use the meta language of the King James Version, mm -hmm. what we find is all of these things, you know, like interpretation, uh, these things are actually subject uh, even prophecy, etc. These things are subject to the uh, the judgment, if you will, of the prophets themselves. And so, did you find that particular kind of protocol within yes, this yes, group of people? She would accept that as well. I, I did not hear you. Yes, the the answer is yes. The supernovas would accept that interpretation as well. They are subject to the prophets. Okay, but when, when they said that, you know, when they would articulate that they were prophesying or even mm -hmm. uh, interpreting uh, the tongues, what, how, how would they explain that to you in, in terms of product? Well, they, first of all, they don't explain it to, the, to me. What they do is they, they would practice and explain it to the congregation so that there are people who speak in tongues in the Appalachian tradition, for instance, who are interpreted to be also prophesizing in their tongue speaking. And again, the criteria would be whether or not what is being prophesied is consistent with their understanding of the totality of the King James Bible. Why do you feel like so many people who, quote unquote, speak in tongues in this particular kind of text, a context, uh, utilize the King James Version? And the reason that I ask, it's probably the worst representation of any Greek text on the market. Yeah, well, I understand that, but the 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 people that I'm uh, studying, the Appalachian tradition, also are linked very strongly with the fundamentalist tradition, and part of what the fundamentalist tradition um, settled upon was the King James Bible. So the the superhandling tradition only will use the King James Bible. And in fact, they would, if you brought another Bible to the church, they would, they would laugh and say, what are you doing with that funny Bible? <laughs> they simply accept the King James, that's it. Uh, what is your understanding, or how would you construe their rejection of facts in this context? You know, w when it comes to looking at, uh, for instance, manuscript, you know, evidence, etc not squaring up with these uh, different uh, translation theories. Yeah, for instance, uh, the, the, the tradition I study, studies relied so heavily upon the Gospel of Marx, and of course, the passage is referring to serpent handling by a consensus, or a later addition to the Gospel of Marx. Exactly. But the, the serpent handling tradition um, simply rejects that. They don't get involved in higher order criticism and they simply um, dogmatically accept the King James Bible as the inerrant Word of God, even though from a scholarship point of view, that is simply false. Christopher. <clears throat> Dr. Hood. Um, yes. I, I can't help but notice that um, through the use of uh, the language that you use in talking about uh, psychology of religion or psychology and religion or religion and psychology, however you want to talk about it, um, I'm going to challenge you a little bit um, because it sounds like what you're saying is religion, if I were to put it into an equation, religion equals phenomenological experience, which is totally subjective, multiplied by many people who share that phenomenological experience 
And that seems to equal a religion. And, and the bottom line is, you're, you're considering that a core belief. And those phenomenological experiences <coughs> are really subjective. And, you know, uh, being a scientist, you know, we, we know what uh, happens to the average, right? Um, mm. So the bottom line is, if one person is having a phenomenological experience that allows them to talk to God, uh, they're considered delusional or psychotic. Um, if two people, uh, it's called a codependent relationship. If multiple people, it's called a cult. Um, but if more than a couple people and a couple more than a, a handful of people, it's kind of called a religion. So what is this core that you're talking about? Because once again, I want to take it out of the religious context and put it into the psychological context and say, our brains have evolved in such a way that facilitate um, a resonance with um, communicating with people and engaging with people that have common and shared experiences. And that is confirmation bias to its core. And that's mm -hmm. fine because um, instead of rejecting it, right, whatever you resist persists. We're all humans. We all recognize that confirmation bias exists. And if I were to say that exists for you but not for thee, then I'm not being human, right? So being that confirmation bias is what it is, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what you consider your core of the religious experience because when you break it down into nuance, it's really just this phenomenological experience of, and, and, and let's just call it what it is, it's called revelation. Yeah, I don't mind where you're going with that. that first place, I'm, I'm sensitive to the notion that often the di distinction between a prophet and a madman is how many people follow him. So I accept the notion that there has to be... <laughs> That's a, good. A, a, wow, a, that was great. Excellent, Dr. Degree, a, Dr. a degree of consensus. But I'm not sure why you want to dismiss what you call phenomenological experience so quickly because what I want to argue is there may be basic kinds of experiences that human beings can have and on the basis of that experience they can share if you will a kind of world view so that's the same thing holds for instance mystical experience as would hold for scientific experience science uh, gives you the capacity to experience the world a particular way and to replicate that experience in a shared way and that is no different than focusing upon mystical experiences which can be facilitated and can be shared in the same way but the the irony is whether you want to be a scientist or whether you want to be a mystic is you have to actually um, do what it takes to facilitate that experience and if you choose not to that's fine, but it doesn't invalidate that experience as a mere, you know, phenomenal subjectivity. It simply says that the nature of that reality is forever um, hidden from you if you choose not to explore it. But Dr. Hood, let, let's face the facts. You're you're calling, um, and once again, I'm challenging you, and, and I'm well, doing it for the purpose. I'm doing it for the purpose of discussion, not sure, because I disagree with you. Um, let's face. What you're calling a common core, um, if it is really what you're labeling it, which is a common core amongst humans, why don't why doesn't everybody who has a spiritual experience just resonate with the same religion? My if it's that common, well, what my argument would be, they probably do. That is, the common core can be located within all the religious and secular traditions. So I would argue there is a mystical core in Judaism, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Christianity, in Islam, that in fact is shared, but the, the focus is upon the difference in interpretations, not upon that experience. Um, yeah, the, the, you're helping us so much, uh, and, and your generosity and willingness to, uh, to go into the second hour uh, we're, we're extremely grateful, and we won't abuse the, the privilege. But uh, your, your, your career is so distinguished, and you have seen decades of change in the scientific study of religion. 
uh, taking the world's religious experiences, if you will, the sort of collective experiences of humanity, for we are, of course, one species. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how the science of religion has had to change um, in, in the decades that you've been active and have contributed to it under this, this pressure to take the, the broadest of range of experiences? Because even James, of course, only had a, a mild acquaintance with Asian philosophies and mostly, as you know, um, uh, uh, stuck to uh, Western traditions, Abrahamic traditions, mostly Christianity, of course. But recently, uh, you know, diversity seem, seems to be something that needs to be respected. What, what is so much better about science of religions nowadays than perhaps think, when you were a graduate student? I think you've already hit the nail on the head. I think for a long time, certainly American psychology of religion was the study of, of Protestant college students. <laughs> and most of the, the data um, was derived from surveys and studies. Of, of Protestants in, in, in colleges and that from that people tried to develop um, a theory of religion which was highly um, lopsided. So I think the most important thing that's happened is people have recognized that if you can, if you can paraphrase Gadamer, he who knows one language knows none and who studies right. one religious tradition knows no religion. And so I think the most important thing that has happened that's beneficial is people testing their views against the great range of phenomena that we identify as religion and not simply trying to develop a theory out of uh, American Protestant experience. And that would go as well for skeptics interested in denying religion, atheists in America for of course. They could fall into a trap of of taking whatever local Christianity is annoying them the most sure. and, and decrying religion in general. Would atheists that narrowly focused really be missing out on an opportunity to even understand their own status as non-believers? Because the logic remains the same. How can I really know what it means to be just a naturalist, to be completely non-religious? If you have never really compared your worldview against any others. Sure, and I think the problem that many people have noted with the, the so-called new atheists is they tend to attack a very straw man theory of religion. Yes. And so I always tell my students, in a sense, everybody's an atheist. Everybody has some God they don't believe in. So the question becomes, when you want to focus upon ideological options, what are the range of religious worldviews, and how do they overlap and contrast with the range of naturalist worldviews? And complexity and diversity is the name of the game. And any effort to totalize and reject something under a simple noun name is, is essentially foolish. Uh, mm -hmm. it, Anton wow. Rigo is a famous good. psychologist of religion and is uh, credited as saying idea. to understand one is to understand the other. You, you need to, the, there are two halves here that need to be focused on to get a larger picture. I, I'm very intensely aware that there will be atheists viewing this who will promptly scream out and say, I don't need to know a hundred gods in order to reject all of them. I don't need to get acquainted with a hundred religions in order to be a, a, a genuine, a perfectly reasonable atheist. But it, we're here interested not in the frameworks, we're interested in the breadth of human experience itself. And if I understand um, you correctly, Dr. Hood, we need to focus on the range of human experience. When uh, someone who wants to be non-religious simultaneously locks themselves off tidally away from the vast stretches and breadth of, of range and dimensions, aesthetic, emotional, cognitive, that the human race is capable of experiencing, wouldn't that atheist be taking a risk of ending up living a rather, say it, stunted existence? Yeah, I think, you know, one of my interests in psychology is precisely to understand the range of human experience and all that is possible. And one of the things that both atheists and religious people share 
when you do uh, interesting kinds of assessment is a sense of wonder and a sense of awe in the diversity of yes. phenomena. In individual differences. Between, between a kind of um, vertical transcendence and a horizontal transcendence. And many atheists have this strong sense of awe and wonder that is on a horizontal dimension, that they're part of something much larger than themselves. And to understand that and how that interplays yes. with people who look at a, a vertical dimension of transcendence uh, uh, is a kind of communication that broadens the perspective of us all if we're willing to engage and listen to one another on the basis of how the world can be experienced. And goodness forbid that we actually engage in that level of conversation because that is something that will facilitate finding common ground and moving forward. And, and, and I just want to let you know, Dr. Hood, that you just validated the fact that, you know, I'm surrounded by a, I'm a linguist and a philosopher and, a, and I happen to study psychology. And it, guess what? Psychology wins. Thank you for proving that point. <laughs> well, and, and let me, let me um, uh, point out one further irony. And I'm going to interrupt um, at some point a, a, because atheism, this guy is doing great. Uh, atheism, of course, has many ways of manifesting its differences from religion of which a sort of narrow-minded bigotry is but one. Uh, we're not certainly not characterizing even all new atheists, much less all atheists. But there does seem to be a dead-end risk because, of course, atheists are quick to point out that it's sheer bigotry against them, that they're not capable of experiencing deep emotional, deeply affective, deeply aesthetic emotions. You use some words like awe and wonder. Often religious people think they have a monopoly not only on the words, but on the experiences as well, which is uh, not correct by any means. They're more but human atheists, than us. Uh, it, Well, no, they're not. But, uh, but atheists can fall into the same trap if they assume that in order to be genuine, true blue atheists, they have to so thoroughly deny anything that has ever been called religious that they end up themselves being very isolated from the very things that they dislike very much when religious people claim ownership over them. If awe is awe, why shouldn't atheists claim it too? Exactly. And empirical research shows uh, that in fact they do. That One of the interesting things is that people who are on, on some measure of open to experience, whether they're theists or atheists, share the same kind of uh, experiences of awe and wonder that are you know, and for all practical purposes, identical, and atheists are not shut out from some of the great things that people who are devoutly religious also experience. I think uh, researchers in the public may come to find that atheists have a lot more in common with Carl Sagan than they do with Richard Dawkins mm -hmm. at, at times when they're trying to be understood. So uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Christopher uh, Silver's research on uh, the six types of non-belief, we have an excellent uh, collection where we asked uh, our research participants if they could describe uh, any experiences they've had which were profound, awe-inspiring, which they would not, uh, you know, spirituality or religion did not do justice. And we have quite a large collection of, of amazing uh, snippets. Some people saying that there's merely matter in motion and other people talking about all beauty, uh, you know, the underlying motion of, of physics and standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Great, Tommy. I'm glad you brought that up. And also, would you mention for our audience the name of the website where people can go and <coughs> read more about this research? Um, they can go to atheismresearch.com, and there's a brief overview of our uh, research on there. All right, we terrific. Also, we also have a Facebook uh, page. If they type in atheism research, they can uh, follow us on Facebook and get updates uh, as we continue researching non-belief. Uh, Dr. Hood, uh, I have really enjoyed so many of the things that you're saying to the extent that uh, I would like for you to come to Pensacola and let us film you or send a, at least uh, a cameraman up there to film some of these statements. You're making some awesome points that I so agree with. Sure, we could work that out. Sounds good, sounds good. Let's move on to fundamentalism uh, in, in this kind of context. I'm, I'm curious to pick your brain a bit 
on the doctrine of hell. What are your ideas concerning the teaching of hell? Well, the fundamentalists, of course, that, that I study um, take a, a, a firm view that there is um, a heaven and a hell, and um, their position, of course, is that only by being obedient and conforming um, to the will of God do you have a chance for salvation for heaven as opposed to hell. I think that the psychological aspect that most interests me is fundamentalists tend to use the fear of hell as a way to produce um, compliance with beliefs and practices so that there's a very um, difficult psychology involved in the fact that much of fundamentalist behavior is not really internalized belief as much as it is complying because they fear of going to hell. When children are in the room, that is in the auditorium, in the sanctuary, hearing uh -huh. someone teaching hellfire and brimstone, uh -huh. what are the results in the child's mind? Well, I think the results in the child's mind are, are the results that are occurring in everybody's mind, that if you accept that, if you actually believe that, then there's a tremendous pressure to comply. And, of course, the danger is you're never assured by compliance that you actually are not going to hell. So I think there's a very um, foreboding, if you will, uh, atmosphere that makes it very difficult to believe in a doctrine of hell and then have a psychologically, you know, healthy um, development because it's just uh, a constant threat and a demand for compliance. And of course, the compliance can be on whatever the, the simple values of that fundamental group might be, whether it's sexuality or anything else, the compliance is absolutely demanded. Well, I have to admit, uh, Dr. Hood, it, it almost sounds like you're talking about uh, abuse in some manner. Um, so I, I, I'd actually like to hear uh, what you have to say about that because um, I, I, I think the, the elephant in the room is um, teaching children that there is a hell can be very damaging to the children that that is taught to. And um, I'm not going to say that it is abuse in and of itself, but I, I, I am willing to say that there is an abusive element um, to using the hell concept as a um, criteria upon which you teach your children um, where morality lies. So I, I'd like to hear your opinion. About sure, that. and there's, there's some good psychological evidence that fundamentalists uh, as a group tend to use very strict um, interpretations of the Bible linked with forms of physical punishment. And so it, certainly that doctrine can lead to abusive behavior um, and it's just part of the, the danger of that fundamentalist mindset. Can I jump in, Dr. Hood? You're aware, I don't know how much you've integrated this into your research yet, but you're well aware of psychological studies into morality recently of the sort by uh, Jonathan Haidt and uh, so forth that talk about a spectrum of disagreement over what really is the core of morality, the, the so-called uh, conservative mind, which is a bit misnomer because we immediately think of it in, in political sense. But, but uh, someone who uh, prefers their morality a bit more authoritarian, concerned about purity, in-group, out-group distinctions, and so forth. Do you think that it's possible that especially during developmental phases, uh, childhood, uh, early adulthood, adolescence, and so forth, that the dread, the anxiety, the provocation of that level of fear could shift a person on the curve a bit? It could uh, take a person no matter where they may happen to fall from the nature contribution and by the time the person is an adult, shift them a little bit, or, or in some cases, for some individuals, quite a bit if they weren't 
of the more conservative morality mindset already? And, and would that help to explain why there's a greater prevalence of uh, authoritarian preference, purity preference, uh, a tribalistic preference among the conservative religions that use hell uh, so effectively? Yeah, I think there's a, you know, if you take like a developmental perspective or stages of faith development, I think that one of the very effective things that fundamentalist religions do is, is stop the, the, the notion of moving up through stages of faith development. And they can do that by not only having a clear commitment to very um, literalist interpretations of scripture, but by forming communities that give and sustain support to that. So part of the power of fundamentalism has always been that they, they opt out of the larger diverse educational environments. And you can be a fundamentalist and go from your home to daycare to elementary to, to high school to college through one system that sustains that authoritarian uh, interpretation of ethics and therefore um, shifts you uh, or gradually moves you into a very conservative direction. And, and the, you can sustain that because you can have clear-cut notions of what's right and wrong. Nothing is in that shade of gray area. And then we see that most specifically in fundamentalists in their interpretations, for instance, of sexual behaviors. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, did you have a question for Dr. Hood? I, I did. I, I'm very curious about, since he has some somewhat of a, a extensive, from what I can tell, immersion in um, a religious culture that he may not actually agree with. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I haven't heard him speak on that. I'm, I'm wondering what his um, his input is on on why this sort of culture is propagated. Why why it's necessary um, in a small, very very religious, uh, very uh, stringent culture, a religious culture, to maintain that level of of um, strictness of the doctrines. Why it doesn't uh, become more um, more more liberal, and and would that be having to do with the level of education, or would that be having to do with the uh, the control that's maintained um, by those in in the community who are sort of in power, if you will? Yeah, I think that one of the one of the fallacies to think that if you are very fundamentalist or very conservative in your religious views that you can't be intelligent. And while there's some evidence that fundamentalists tend to be a bit lower in intelligence than other religious groups, it's it's not really a a very significant difference. But fundamentalists no, please, please don't do. misunderstand me. I'm not talking about intelligence. I'm talking about the availability of information and a desire to educate yourself. I'm not talking about how, how smart someone is. Okay, if you understand, good, good. Um, I, I grew up in, in southern Arkansas, and good. I have a terrible education, good. but I have tried my best to educate myself as an adult as well, by, by my own choosing. I've decided to do that, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the intelligence level of someone who is, who is very religious. I'm talking about, uh, especially with regards to the... Um, the say the in information that's come about related to uh, a young earth understanding of the Bible um, and those who choose not to investigate um, the actual scientific evidence of that they, they, they prefer instead to hold on to a stricter interpretation of the Bible or the, the Quran for that matter um, and in, in that regard it's not a matter of them being intelligent or not, it has. It's a matter of their priorities with what uh, what they believe and what what they're willing to investigate and learn about. Yes. Um, that I think is is really the, the the dynamic that I'm most interested in is is why in these very insulated um, cultures like the the snake handling communities that you're talking about, uh, I assume they are they're rather um, insulated. Um, I, I'm I'm wondering what propagates that yeah. from a psychological yeah. perspective. I appreciate your uh, your distinction here, and, and I actually agree with you. And the book I wrote on fundamentalism, wrote a book on the psychology of religious fundamentalism, 
And what I argue, what really distinguishes... What's the name of that book? book? What's the name of that book? Psychology of Religious Fundamentalism. But, but what, what I argue there, what really distinguishes the fundamentalist is their intratextual interpretations. That is, instead of using multiple sources, you know, what I call an intertextual approach, they believe that the one source is sufficient for everything, and they construct their worldview and their meaning out of that singular source. And so what makes them quite different is they form communities based upon that single source, their own understanding and interpretation of Scripture, and don't look for um, other avenues that would broaden their perspective. And an example That's exactly what I meant. Thank you very much. supported by the, the United States is a group of fundamentalists that actually a lot of people like, but, but are very curious if people truly understood them, and that's the Amish. Because the Amish won a very significant Supreme Court case where they did not have to educate their children beyond the eighth grade. And the Amish argued successfully that they educate people for the form of life that they're going to live and maintain and do not educate them to, be, to live in a larger context. And I think fundamentals are able to survive precisely because they can isolate themselves by forming this intratextual community and not looking for additional avenues that would modify or broaden their beliefs or practices. Let, 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 let me ask this question. Uh, and it has to do with interpretation because, you know, a person's hermeneutic is very fascinating to me. I keep asking universalists, Protestants, uh, Catholics what their hermeneutic is. And it's mm -hmm. all over the place in most of those camps. Uh, but in particular, when we deal with fundamentalists, uh, they look for a text that's not clear. They're looking for a text that's extremely ambiguous. For instance, the King James Version is extremely ambiguous, and anyone who can read English can tell that. And so my question would be, why are fundamentalists looking for extremely ambiguous reads? Well, such as the, the, King James Bible. the answer to that first is that for fundamentalists, the, the, the solution was not the ambiguous King James Bible, but the King James Bible that they believe is the inerrant word of God. And what they do is they're able to take passages that have a, claim, a, a plain meaning. For instance, if you take the serpent handling tradition, they would say the Gospel of Mark has a very simple meaning. It says, they shall take up serpents. And they're able to pull out passages that have a plain meaning and then institutionalize a set of rituals and procedures that follow from that meaning. But, but I guess my point is... Uh, there are so many things in the King James Version that you can read which are uh, extremely ambiguous. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, these mm -hmm. particular passages because you know there are just too many, but just for the sake of time, because we're running out of time, it, it seems like they're going after something that's extremely ambiguous. For instance, in religion, that is in the Protestant mindset, uh, mm -hmm. we have roughly uh, 38,000 different denominations and uh, it seems like the supporting mechanism would be uh, an ambiguous text. In other sure. words, we, we do not have a lot of concord. We have very little agreement, in other words. And so uh, do fundamentalists pride themselves in uh, the ambiguity of a text so they can read whatever they want to into it? In other words, are they doing more eisegesis rather than exegesis? I, th I think that you're onto something in that you know, my argument, and I've written a lot on the, the, the ambiguity that's involved in various textual passages, but the, the value of the ambiguity is it allows each group to form its own interpretation, and if somebody disagrees, they form another group. So one of the interesting things about fundamentalists is they continually fragment based upon their particular interpretations. Well, then why can't I have a church? Well, you can. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not playing games. Um, why, why can't I have a church? Uh, the the what, church of Maori meditation. No, I'm not, I'm not playing. Uh, I understand that fundamentalists um, 
uh, a new brand of fundamentalists, uh, the ones that I interact with, are mm -hmm. not necessarily interested in um, the, the kind of church that we understand. Or, or maybe I'm, I'm talking about my bias. Uh, I was raised Roman Catholic, so the church was the vehicle through which you understood God. And I understand that, um, you know, uh, fundamentalist Pentecostal Baptists see it completely differently. So I'm, an, I'm, I'm admitting my bias. But that being said, what's preventing me from doing um, seeding? Uh, I think that's what they call it. Uh, seeding uh, home churches um, uh, and churches not being brick and mortar places where people congregate, but literally homes um, where people congregate so that the good word is being spread. And um, what's the difference between that and what I'm doing right now? Well, the, the, the first difference is that one identifies itself as a religion. And you may not do that. But the, the interesting thing about the United States is you simply can form your own church if you want to. And all you would have to do is, is have a congregation and you could be recognized very easily. And, and it, is, it, it almost sounds like you're talking against the legislation that allows for religion in the United States, which isn't what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about legislation. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about okay. theology, religion, and psychology. What's the difference? Okay. Well, take the difference between the, the Catholics that you brought up and, and, and the logic, let's say, of the Protestants. The Catholics have the teaching magisterium of the church, so that, that's one kind of control. The Protestants have a similar thing, but, but they put the infallibility, if you will, in the text. But the text is filtered through fallible minds. So the, the psychology that's involved is even if you argue that the, the King James Bible in some sense was infallible, by the time it's read by individuals with fallible minds, you get diverse psychologies forming diverse groups of people. Diverse psychologies, I mean, let's face it, psychology is the study of humans, and we're all humans. So what do you mean by diverse psychologies? Well, because different people, two people reading the King James Bible, however they read it, can come out with radically different interpretations. And those interpretations will be justified by their reading of Scripture, and they will form groups of people who share their interpretation, and they will counter other groups of people using, ironically, the same text that form a, a group based upon their interpretation. And as I tell people, by the time you get two Baptists sitting down reading the Bible, you get three opinions. Um, <laughs> that, that's not the first time I heard that. And I think that, yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. Uh, John Shook yeah. actually uh, used well, that exact reference yeah, earlier, did, this, day, did. earlier and, this morning. And, and I, I only, uh, I, you know, I lived in Oklahoma for a time and, so much for being uh, original, man, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the joke they tell in Oklahoma is a little bit different. Why do you take two Baptists with you when you go fishing? Okay. Well, the answer is, of course, very practical. If you only take one Baptist, he'll drink all your beer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good. I, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask a question, sort of, uh, just for your opinion. Um, what, how do you think that uh, insulated communities of uh, religious, especially Protestant groups of Christians in the United States who uh, are, are doing their best to maintain a um, uh, sort of a static uh, community of strict belief in uh, the, 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 literal, the literal interpretation of the Bible as, you know, however that may, might manifest? Um, how do you think that is going to change with the availability of information through the internet um, in, in the next, say, 20 or 30 years? I actually think it's a really good question because I think that the internet has changed everything. That the ability to control um, access to information is minimal. Every kid has some kind of smartphone, phone, uh, has access to the internet. And I think that the ability of of groups to control access to information uh, is less and less, and I think that really strict fundamentalist 
communities will have a hard time maintaining their insular status. Do you think that's why we're having so much uh, upheaval and and tension in the United States right now with with uh, religious blowback from things like uh, gay marriage and um, uh, just all of it. It's just it turn, it's turning into one big sort of um, smorgasbord of, of objections based on on um, accurate or even completely misguided interpretations of what the Bible actually says. It's it's becoming worse and worse over time. The the way that they're responding, from what I can tell. I think gay marriage is a perfect example because, you know, it surprises me as a psychologist that there's been such a rapid cultural shift in the acceptance of gay marriage and the religious protests that some fundamentalist groups make to um, the gay marriage issue um, simply isn't going to be heard. It's clear that the culture has shifted and the fundamentalists are fighting a losing battle on that front. Uh, Dr. Hood, I'm looking for people who would really make strong statements along these lines. Now, I'm aware that psychologists are limited in what they can say concerning what I'm getting ready to tell you. I think teaching hell is child abuse. And so, however you can frame what you need to say, can you speak to that that I just stated? Yeah, um, I don't. I, I would probably say that, that it's it's hard to say that teaching that doctrine is child abuse because we have such a long tradition of religious freedom. But I think that it is child abuse if you preach the King James Bible as if that's all that it's about. So if, if we go back to the issue of ambiguity in the totality of even the King James Bible, right, there's a more balanced view. So I would think that, that it would be hard put to say that you could not um, teach the King James Bible, um, especially if you're a religious fundamentalist. And you would just hope that as children mature, they're able to get other sources of information and a more balanced reading of Scripture. Right. You know, these children in these particular churches that are told that they're totally depraved, totally wretched, worthless, yeah. I mean, that, in my opinion, is abusive to a child. Sure it is, but it's also true that if, if the child is educated enough to read all of the King James Bible, then the notion that they're just totally depraved and worthless won't sustain itself. That's a bold assumption. Well, and it is, and of course studies have shown that the group of religious people in America that read the Bible the least and read the whole Bible the least are in fact the most extreme conservative fundamentalists. And the reason is they pick and choose and take certain passages they want and don't put it in the context of all of Scripture. But that being said, I mean, as a psychologist, you have to realize that you're talking about a niche demographic as compared to the general demographic, you know, um, that we're talking about. We're, we're trying to talk about the middle part of the bell curve, not the uh, uh, sure. uh, lower fringe or the higher fringe, not the anomalies. Um, and it sounds like you're, you're, you're qualifying what you're saying in such a way that, like, well, yeah, that, that, that wouldn't happen so long as dot, dot, dot. But what happens after that dot, dot, dot prevents it from being a global human concept. Well, but that dot, 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 I mean, studies do show that as fundamentalists move through educational systems, as they get additional sources of information, fundamentalists tend to move toward the middle of the bell curve. It's only fundamentalists who isolate and maintain uh, an isolated community and control the education that are able to maintain people. They're members as strict fundamentalists. And as we talked about the Internet, as more and more sources of information become available, even to these isolated communities, then they move more towards the center of that bell curve. 
I can walk up to a fundamentalist and say, hey, listen, I can look at the Greek text and the Hebrew text, and I, I, I can read it. I'm a linguist. Mm -hmm. There is no syntagmatic and paradigmatic analysis that would even suggest a hell in any of the manuscripts that we call scripture. However, mm -hmm. it is found in some extremely failed meta-languages that we call these English Bibles. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't satisfy fundamentalists and these mm -hmm. people of this kind of thinking. My question is, why? Why? Because the fundamentalist in my language is an intertextualist, and they dogmatically accept the King James Bible, are not interested in its origin and how it came to be, not interested in Greek translations, not interested in Hebrew translations. They're simply satisfied with the King James Bible and their unique interpretation of it. So in other words, they're really not interested in uh, the authors of Greek or Hebrew, they're really not interested in the authentic Jesus is what you're saying. They're just interested in the King James Jesus? Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, as a that's scientist, that, that's, like, like, that's like saying, um, uh, I will take at face value what you tell me without um, accepting any of your references or your lit, uh, lit review that uh, uh, allows you to build a hypothesis upon which your research is built. I mean, it, it's like saying um, your conclusions live in a vacuum. Well, or in a psychological sense, studies show that uh, there's a set of fundamentalists who have this classic uh, notion of authoritarian submission. They submit to what they consider to be appropriate authorities, combined with aggression toward the outfit. So you just, they the, you just hit the nail on the head. You just hit the nail on the head right there. You just pointed out the very psychological dynamic that prevents people from moving beyond what they accept when they read a Bible, King James, uh, NIV, whatever it might be, as a text in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, you, you, uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't know, uh, I might be speaking alone here, but you just nailed the psychological dynamic that prevents people from moving beyond thinking for themselves, right? Because you just said, because they accept an authoritarian uh, perspective. Yeah, exactly, and I think there's good, uh, good empirical evidence that that characterizes this kind of fundamentals that we're talking about. Well, it's the epistemic version of the ontological argument. In other words, there must be some final reality somewhere. You can pursue an infinite regress, you can pursue a chain of explanations, but to a religious mind in the grip of a need for some final, 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 that's it, I've got my guarantees, there has to be a prime mover, there has to be a first cause, there has to be something that you just decide it's absolutely necessary. And in fact, psychologically, it doesn't actually really even matter what that is. So the <laughs> fundamentalist is perfectly consistent internally when they need an authoritative source of morality. Well, you can explain this text by a prior text, and you can explain that text by a prior... But you don't want an infinite regress. You have to have an absolute authority somewhere, says this kind of mind, mm -hmm. looking to submit. So any text is utterly arbitrary. They picked the King James one because that was the one taught to them, available in a vernacular they understand. And that's it. They've got their prime mover. They've got their first cause. They've got their direct word of God. And any other information, really, at that point, just pretty much come, becomes irrelevant, doesn't it? Yes, I think so. There's a bumper sticker they have in the South that says, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Yeah, I've seen that. And doc Dr. Hood, I'd just like to um, change the tone here a bit. I, I hope that you'll, you'll bear with me. And um, I, at, Growing up in the, in the isolated community that I did, um, the Internet didn't, it didn't really um, hit full stride until I was ready to graduate high school. So that should give you an idea of, of roughly how old I am. Um, for someone who is interested in uh, learning honestly about the world, um, despite the the pressures and the um, restrictions that are placed on them by their community, and the 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 way that that's going to affect their their relationships with their family and their friends, um, what advice would you give for someone who does? want to figure out what's true apart from uh, what their 
their family might be telling them, their, their religious um, uh, leaders might be telling them? How, how would you guide someone like that to, to find a, a more nuanced, uh, thoughtful, even, even understanding of their own faith as opposed to only uh, strictly following along with what their, their community is telling them? What sort of advice would you give? Well, before you answer that, uh, uh, I, I would like to say that, you know, we, we only have a little bit of time left, and uh, we spent the whole time talking about descriptive stuff, and I love the fact that Matthew Steele uh, just stepped in and said, what do you have to say that is prescriptive? So uh, that being said, I'm really curious to hear your response. Yeah, and my response is, is really quite simple. Yeah, I always encourage my students to get multiple sources. So whatever, if you're, if you're a Catholic and you're, you're caught in, in a very narrow particular interpretation, I tell them to read about Catholicism, to read the, the diverse points of view. And again, the Internet makes it so wonderful because any, any issue, if you want to read about the Gospel of Mark that you just made, you can read about the debates over various endings of the Gospel of Mark, various interpretations. So I think that... Uh, that, that there's a lot of hope for the future because there's no way that communities now can totally control access to information. Uh, Dr. Hood, I, I would like to thank you for being on our program. We are out of time, uh, but uh, I wish the show could continue a little bit longer because I, I find just in listening to you that you really care about people and you want to see change. And uh, you've had some powerful words tonight. Uh, you've stated some things that really have touched me in particular. And uh, if you could say just a couple of things that would give us some advice, that is, on our network, what can we do for fundamentalists in particular, that is, as a network for you know these people who are trapped in a sense? Well, I think that the, the, the best thing that can be done always is a kind of gentle criticism. And what I mean by that, especially for fundamentalists, you can't suddenly just bombard them with a total critique. I think what you have to do is take them where they're at and move them slowly, step by step, in a broader direction. And so I think that you can get fundamentalists in dialogues, and you can begin to dialogue uh, on, a, on a particular topic and move it in a, in a, in a direction that will at least get them to consider other possibilities. And I think those small seeds then have significant effects down the road. Yes, I think that's that exactly so right. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for making that well explicit. Said. That's perfect. So well said. That is, I mean, that really nails what NCG is all about. Having dialogue, being patient, being kind, and you put it so well. What do you think about this, Chris? I mean, I, mean, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm amped, man. I, I wish we had another hour to talk about this because, like, not only do I have statements, I have questions. I, I, I want the dialogue that you just described with you. And, and, and I want to make it clear that, you know, the points where I was challenging you um, was, was merely for the sake of discussion. And let's face it, this discussion was fantastic. It was Do top, Dr. Hood, top I'd just like to point out that uh, Christopher and myself are atheists, and we, we do our best to engage in this dialogue for the sake of the dialogue, because we consider it important. And I, I, I want to thank you uh, sincerely for uh, caring about the dialogue as much as we do. Yeah. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. And, and let, let me make this statement. Uh, so many of our atheist friends... Uh, they are bashed because they are so kind to theists who are struggling with these problems. Mm. And uh, it's, it's, it's tragic. And uh, as a theist, I get bashed all the time uh, <laughs> by theists and atheists alike. So uh, it just comes with the territory. But you, you really have touched my heart. I mean, you have a lot of wisdom. I want you to come to Pensacola. If you don't come here, we're going to go to you. We want to film you with high def because you've got a lot between the left and the right ear that we need uh, here at NCG. And so thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very uh, much. I want you to come back soon, and uh, that would be amazing.
Well, thanks so much for joining us, you two. We've kept you up late, yep. but um, uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing you two again. Good to see you again, Tommy. Thank you. If I could just add one thing and invite all the viewers out Please. there to check out uh, religiousstudiesproject.com and find us on Facebook. We have a podcast airing tomorrow on a cognitive theory of religion with uh, Dr. Stuart Guthrie, and it's a uh, very interesting. Religion is anthropomorphism, so please check it out. Awesome. Is, is there anything else you want to promote, Tommy? Uh, thank you guys very much for having us on. Uh, Great. Uh, Dr. Hood, my wife right now is with my grandson in Kansas, and she sent me a little note during the show, and she said that she loved your beard as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so, hey, you guys have fun, and we love you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, once again, this has been The Place, and we've had a good time tonight, and I was so thankful that you guys were here in Pensacola to share this time. Uh, Dr. Hood is good. He's oh, got a heart. Better than good. He nailed some things tonight. He knows what he's talking about. Yes, he man. does. Uh, we're blessed to have a man like this in our lives. And I'm hoping that our audience can find it uh, within themselves to explore a bit about what it means to be kind and considerate to each other. Uh, learning how to have conversations uh, without pushing, without uh, putting each other down. That's what the place is all about. That's what NCG is about. That's what the cult of honesty is about. So I'm going to ask God to dismiss us. Would you, God? <laughs> That being said, I really don't know what to say other than uh, I would like to thank everybody who showed up tonight and uh, have a fabulous evening. Good night. Good night.